Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Bill Potterly, the director of the Institute for Clinical and Translational Sciences. Uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our fifth annual ICTS uh, symposium, the title of which this year is Advancing Clinical and Translational Science at an Academic Health System. Um, a title that was deliberately chosen to reflect the fact that as we evolve from a single academic uh, center into a system, it's important to start thinking about how we advance clinical and translational science at a system level. Uh, to get us started, I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, Dr. David Pollmutter, uh, Dean uh, of the School of Medicine, Executive Vice Chancellor for Health in the, at the university, who has been a strong supporter of clinical and translational science over the last few years. Thanks, Bill. Thank you all, and, and, and welcome. Um, we're excited. To, do, to have the fifth annual symposium of ICTS. I'm so glad um, I, I noticed on the title that it's year 16, which means it got renewed twice so far. And, um, and, and just to thank Bill, who's uh, taken on the role of the director and done many, many good things to advance us, including getting renewal number two to happen successfully. And um, I'd also like to thank our partners uh, who were part of the whole structure of the ICTS, BJH, SLCH, BJC Healthcare, SLU, UHSP, and, and University of Missouri, um, all part of the um, the ecosystem for clinical research that's a part of what ICTS um, does. We, um, I'm excited to hear what we're going to do today with the symposium because it's, it's ever more clear how important clinical research is to what I call the virtuous cycle of academic medicine. We, we see patients, we use our interaction with patients to feed our research and education uh, mission. And then um, that research and education mission differentiates us and allows us then to bring new treatments to the patients who are referred to us. WashU has long had a fabulous reputation in basic science and in, and particularly in basic science that's um, focused on mechanism of disease. Um, uh, and um, one of the wonderful things that I found when I came back here in 2015 is that um, despite what many of our faculty believe, clinical research is alive and well here on this campus. There has been a ton of great clinical research happening here. Um, and uh, it's a direction that we want to keep going in. We also um, experienced, in a very unique way, the importance of clinical trial capability during the COVID, uh, during, it's not over yet, during um, the intense part of COVID. Um, and um, last night we were giving, we were giving out awards to faculty for, for um, spectacular performance during COVID, and I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm saying the wrong thing, that, that it's over. But um, it was really a unique experience during COVID. We were, and, and Bill was um, involved on the national scene with Active One, uh, and we were hearing all kinds of complaining from the NIH that the academic medical centers could not enroll patients in all the trials that they had. And, uh, and many of you will remember in the midst, middle of the, of, the, of, the, of the bad part of the, of the pandemic, um, we were hearing that um, NIH had trials in which they had in total only 8% of the necessary enrollments. Uh, and and this was a challenge at a time Bill and I talked with Janet Woodcock about, you know, 
um, at particular times during the, the surges, many of the patients would actually be in the community hospitals because that's the way the virus was, was spreading. Um, and that, that brought to light this challenge of how do we access patients across um, our communities uh, for the kinds of trials that we need to have done. So this is um, a big focus for us now. And then I think lastly, I'll just mention to you, Washington University um, really believes in this next five or 10 years that we want to be a more active player in innovation and commercialization. Uh, we want to be um, working in hand with industry partners to get more treatments to patients. Clinical trials are essential for that intention. And so we will be focused on those things that we need to do to keep um, pushing that momentum. And Bill is going to tell us a little bit more about some of those initiatives when he gives his update. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, David, and uh, I, th uh, I think, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, this is indeed a, a, an opportune time to think about what we've learned from the last number of years uh, and how we can advance clinical and translational science, uh, not only here, but contribute to the national uh, debate and, and discussion about that. I want to start by the, uh, what we usually do with our uh, land acknowledgement, recognizing the fact that um, all of us are transient and that uh, we uh, recognize the ancest ancestral and uh, territories of the Illini uh, Confederacy, Osage Nation, and Missouri tribe. And this is a way of recognizing the fact that all of us um, are contribute to uh, the history and, and will contribute to the history of this area, this region, and this, uh, and this nation. So uh, the mission of the ICTS, to remind you, is to advance clinical and translational research and advance discovery to improve health outcomes across the lifespan and benefit um, our uh, diverse communities. And, and, and we do this uh, as a consortium in, in the state of Missouri. So we have uh, partners at St. Louis University and the uh, University of Missouri, uh, as well as with uh, our, our, uh, the, um, our colleagues in the BJC health system. And clinic, just to very quickly remind you that, that uh, clinical research is, is, as David said, a, a virtuous cycle. Um, once you use historic strengths, uh, have been in, in preclinical and early clinical uh, translation, but we have built uh, a substantial infrastructure and increasingly uh, highly regarded competitive and uh, important research programs that bring this into clinical trials, into practice, uh, and into populations. And, uh, and this is something that uh, we will continue to emphasize. And the support of the institution, and particularly the School of Medicine, is critical in augmenting what the support we get from the NIH in order for us to do this more rapidly and more effectively. Um, we, one of the things that we, has been an innovation at Washington University and uh, is the translation science benefits model, which was developed by Doug Luke and his colleagues at the Brown School, and is now used by over 20 uh, CTSAs across the country as a way of measuring impact. Yeah, as one of the things that, is, that we all recognize now, impact is more than just academic papers and grants. It's also about what we contribute to healthcare, to the, our community, to the economic benefit of uh, the societies and, and regions we, we live in, and ultimately to better healthcare policy. And, and certainly, I think all of us recognize over the last number of years how evidence-informed uh, policy will be critical if we're going to ultimately um, change the way we approach healthcare in this country. So we have a new um, 
website that actually ha has tools for either uh, centers, organizations, or individual faculty to measure their impact and allow them to, to uh, show what they're uh, doing and, and, and its impact over time. Um, in collaboration with the Institute of Public Health uh, and with the Department of Medicine, uh, we have a new Center for Advancing uh, Health Services Policy and Economics Research. Again, this whole role of advancing research that will not only inform how we uh, have more efficient and more effective and impactful health services, but also um, how that might ultimately influence uh, policy. And uh, Karen Joint Maddox, who's in the audience and uh, would be happy to, t to tell anybody about it at the break. And uh, uh, she co directs this with Tim McBride from the Brown School. It's, David mentioned the impact. And I just wanted to highlight one uh, story that I think is critically important. Um, Tim Miller here uh, is a basic scientist, physician scientist working on ALS who has received support from the ICTS uh, at different times over the last uh, 10 years, 12 years. And just in the last uh, six months, a clinical trial that he was actively involved in and the leader of uh, for the first time uh, showed that uh, for one variant uh, of ALS, uh, single-stranded RNA interference could actually lead to a, a drug that improved the outcome of ALS. Uh, it's a small number of patients because only a small number of of patients carry this particular mutation, but as a proof of concept that we can take something from basic science into the clinic and improve the outcome of a previously untreatable disease, this is a testament to the importance of taking, your, taking patients, taking research from the bedside back into the patients, into the lab, and then back into into patients, and I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful example of why investment in this, in research development at different phases uh, ultimately pays off. Um, David did not mention the fact that uh, we continue to be a major leader in, nationally in NIH research funding, so I'm happy to, to, to say that. Um, but that's done in part because we have wonderful investigators who get NIH funding, and the ICTS is very um, uh, proud of its role in research development, but for clinic, young clinical investigators or people who are on that translational pathway. We've invested a lot of resources in our research development program to help people get their grants. And for those of you who are young faculty looking at this, I will just say, although it's not a randomized uh, controlled study, people who engage with the ICTS are twice as likely to be funded the first time round uh, with their grant application than those who don't. Uh, we invested a significant amount of effort in, in, uh, during the COVID in helping people do pilot grants. We, and I, I've talked at previous meetings about the great success we've had in, in supporting the collaboration at a translational level uh, between uh, Ali Alabidi and Rachel Presti that led to in, in incredible insights into the nature of the immune response initially to the, to the virus itself and then later to, to the vaccine. But we've funded uh, additional investigators and I want to just highlight uh, one uh, of our uh, early pilot funding awardees who's um, generated a new diagnostic test uh, designed ultimately to be point of care and hopefully a point of care that's available worldwide and, and, and in an inexpensive way that can then be um, much more uh, useful uh, at a setting, that, uh, on a global setting. The, uh, one of the things that is critically important to clinical and translational research is engagement with our community. And 
we have been committed to community partnerships. Uh, we have a very robust community partnership program uh, led by uh, Angela Brown and, and Veda Thompson, and uh, where we have really looked not only at our partnerships uh, here in St. Louis uh, with underrepresented populations, but also recognizing that the rural population in the United States is actually falling behind every year in terms of life expectancy and healthcare outcomes compared to urban populations. And as, this, and as, as we are located in the middle of the country with a significant uh, rural hinterland, that's part of what we need to do. But it, as an example of our community partnership, um, we, we have uh, the ICTS and, and, and the IPH collaborating with community-based organizations has uh, been working to improve COVID uh, vaccination in underrepresented populations. And this has led to new partnerships and new um, uh, insights that I think will improve our ability to uh, uh, deliver other healthcare and other areas of, of uh, interdisciplinary research. And I want to particularly uh, congratulate uh, Angela Brown and Elvin Gang for leading this uh, initiative. One of the, the things that the last three years also taught us all uh, was the need to uh, address uh, equity uh, and diversity. And we have started a new initiative um, to really enhance both the recruitment and importantly the retention of historically underrepresented uh, populations in uh, medical school faculty. This is an initiative that will provide mentoring, not just around the, academic, the traditional academic endeavors, but also mentoring around how to survive and develop as a faculty member in a medical school that is dominated by white men. And it's ultimately a very important issue for, for us as, as a medical school, as, a, as an academic community, and I think uh, in healthcare that we, we truly develop a faculty representative of our communities. And I, I, re, I actually want to acknowledge the Dean's strong support for this, that particular initiative. We do collaborate, as I said, for the University of Missouri. We have a joint rural health research center um, and we are also collaborating with St. Louis University and particularly around some of the strengths they have in data science and uh, with the new geospatial uh, data analytics uh, program. And uh, hopefully these uh, collaborations will, will grow in strength uh, over, over the next few years. Um, so coming to the theme of today's talk, as, as David said, th this virtuous cycle of clinical care, inf uh, informing our educational mission, informing our research, and ultimately having impact on the big problems in the communities we, we serve is, is a critical part of what we want to do. And today's um, symposium is focused on two elements of that. Uh, one is that the notion of learning from our clinical care operation to, as a learning health system and, and how we can bring that learning back into uh, both research and uh, outcomes. And the second is, uh, as the Dean mentioned, the issue of bringing our clinical trials to a larger population, particularly those um, in, in the community, and particularly in community settings that reflect and provide care to a population that does not necessarily always come to a large academic medical center. And so I look forward to, the, to our presentations and discussion on those two themes. And finally, I just want to acknowledge um, our uh, poster awards. Uh, we received a large number of posters, and it was difficult to judge the ones that we would actually uh, provide awards to. And uh, uh, all of these are Will available outside 
and we encourage you to go by them during the break, talk to the presenters, all of whom are young uh, junior faculty, um, who, and, and as you can see, reflecting right across our consortium from uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis University, uh, the University of Health Sciences, Pharmacy, and Washington University, and a, and a, and a diverse array of problems. So with that, I want to thank you for your attendance. Um, I want to ask Philip to come up to the uh, podium and introduce our, our first keynote speaker. All right, well, I am very fortunate to get to introduce our first speaker who happens to be a very close friend and colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Chuck Friedman. Uh, and I promised him last night over dinner I would not tell any embarrassing stories in this introduction, so I'll try to keep this uh, uh, just focused on facts. Um, for those of you that uh, don't know Chuck, he is the chair of the Department of Learning Health Sciences as well as the Josiah Macy Jr. Professor of Medical Education at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's also a professor of information and public health, and his work has really focused on and in many ways defined in the informatics uh, field what we now describe as a learning health system, and in particular, as Bill just alluded to, a system where we can continuously study and improve the care we deliver to individuals and populations. Um, before joining the faculty at the University of Michigan, uh, Chuck held a number of senior positions at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, including serving as the Deputy National Coordinator and Chief Scientific Officer during a time at which we saw a profound expansion of ONC's activities that led to widespread adoption of electronic health records as well as data sharing infrastructure at a national level, and Chuck was instrumental in those strategies. Um, and before that, uh, he's held a variety of positions at the NIH, both in NHLBI and the NLM. He is the founding uh, director of what was the Center for Biomedical Informatics at the University of Pittsburgh, now the Department of Biomedical Informatics there, and also served on the faculty at UNC. Um, and again, I feel really fortunate. Chuck has been a very close collaborator of ours uh, here at WashU throughout the entire COVID pandemic, uh, and we've done a lot of work together to try to advance data sharing in a way that I think is consistent with today's uh, theme. Uh, so with that, I will turn over the podium and again, resist the opportunity to tell embarrassing stories about Chuck. So thanks, Chuck. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure uh, to be here. I very much appreciate the invitation and I am also appreciative of Philip not telling about 24 stories he could tell that would turn the color of my face uh, to a different one from what you see now. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about learning health systems uh, today, and I understand we're gonna have a robust opportunity for discussion later, and I welcome that. I have to begin with a disclosure. Uh, uh, there is a not-for-profit called the Learning Health Community trying to promote learning health systems in ways that one cannot do uh, within a university, and I'm proud to be the chair of the board of that organization. Three parts to this talk. I'm gonna give you perhaps a little more detail on learning health systems and what at least I think they are. I'm going to talk about, a qu I'm going to address a question that you would certainly ask me if uh, I didn't try to answer it first. And that is, what's different about this? We've been trying to improve the safety and quality and efficiency of healthcare and other health promotion activities for decades. Uh, what, what's different from these other methods? And I'm going to introduce three main points. Discovery, emphasis on discovery, emphasis on continuity, and above all, and going to the title of this talk, uh, the third characteristic is infrastructure that actually creates a system that can function sustainably and scalably. And I can't emphasize this enough, and that's why I'm uh, making it uh, the third part of this talk, which is, okay, fine, you've said you needed infrastructure. Well, what does it look like? 
What does it mean to have an infrastructure for a learning health system? And I will talk about that. So I'll begin with the definition that's actually very consistent with things that have already been said this morning, that a, a health system at any level of scale, and I'll come back to scale uh, in, in a moment, becomes a learning health system when it acquires the ability to continuously and routinely improve health by marrying discovery to implementation. And this notion of a marriage of the two, a good marriage of the two, is, is very fundamental to this idea. Now, where can I read about this? Well, there are lots of places, but I'll point out two of them, one of which is a shameless commerce promotion of my own journal. And I apologize for that, but uh, it actually is a good source of information about learning health systems. So beginning on the, on the lower right, uh, the journal creatively titled Learning Health Systems, which I have the privilege to edit, is now in its seventh year of publication. And I'm proud to say we're finally going to get an impact factor. That's a struggle these days. And also that we had uh, about 110,000 uh, uh, downloads of articles from the, uh, from the journal website, um, only 44% of which are from the US, which means this has attained the status of the global journal that we had hoped it would be. Uh, reversing history a bit, uh, you can also read a great deal about learning health systems in the series of books and monographs published by the National Academy of Medicine. You're free to download them uh, from that site. And I do need to give credit, of course, to what was then the Institute of Medicine for actually generating this idea as the result of a workshop they held in 2006 and a report of that workshop, which is the first issue in this uh, series that, to my way of thinking, first advanced the title. So uh, how do we begin to think about what a learning health system is? And I'm going to turn to some analogies and metaphors. Uh, and the first one is to think about a parade, like the Mardi Gras parade in St. Louis. Uh, and if this were the learning health system parade, instead of the Mardi Gras parade, what would they be singing as they, as they walked down the street? And I actually said, when I gave this talk at Penn, uh, a few weeks ago <laughs> that I would welcome anybody who wanted to put these anthems to music. And lo and behold, I got an email uh, from someone at Penn who was a musician. Uh, I haven't played this yet, but there exists uh, a song called Bring Us the Tough Problems. And, and what this means is this method is best applied to what have come to be called wicked problems, wicked problems that are truly negatively affecting uh, human health and that have resisted many, many attempts in the past to bring them, uh, uh, bring some improvement in that direction. And I'll just give you one example that is one of our feature learning health system activities in Michigan, and that is out of hospital cardiac arrest, which has about a 10% survival rate. If you want a wicked problem, uh, there is one. Uh, our, uh, our composer also wrote uh, music for this other anthem, A System Problem Needs a System Solution. Wicked problems are system problems. They don't surrender to one fairly obvious intervention. They, they exist at the level and, and, and are caused by a number of problems that have to be viewed as an interconnected system. So that's the second anthem that this parade would be singing. And the third one may be a familiar theme to you, uh, 17 years to 17 months. It's been well documented that there is a latency of something like 17 years between the discovery of new biomedical knowledge and its widespread application in practice. Well, those of us who are proponents of learning health systems believe that widespread adoption of this idea can lower this latency by a whole order of time magnitude and maybe even further to 17 weeks or 17 days, and in the case of a public health emergency, maybe even 17 hours. So another scenario to help clarify what a learning health system is, is to think about an inspector 
who has come to a health system with the task of determining to what extent this health system is a learning health system. And we all know that inspectors carry clipboards, and clipboards contain checklists, and that's what inspectors do. They go down their checklist looking for things. Well, what would this inspector be looking for in this health system to figure out to what extent it's a learning health system? Well, they'll be looking to see if the system captures what it does as data that can be learned from, or does it just fly by or documented in some, in some haphazard way? Do they do something with that data? Routinely, do they create knowledge that is trusted because of the way it was developed and make that rapidly available to support strategies and decisions, and not just decisions by care providers, but decisions by providers and patients and their families and others, uh, managers and others. Do they do this continuously or just bursty? A lot of places turn temporarily into learning health systems when they're threatened uh, in some way, and then after the threat is over, go back to the way they were before. Here's a piece of infrastructure. Is there an infrastructure in place? That creates a system that allows this to happen routinely and with economy of scale. And finally, is all of this part of the culture? And I like to say that if this is part of the culture, when this inspector walked around and talked to people and said, well, why do you do this stuff? They wouldn't be able to tell you. If it's part of the culture, it becomes tacit. And people, well, this is just what we do here. And when a so when a health system becomes a mature learning health system, I think this is the kind of answer you get if you ask this question. Now, to this point of scale, learning health systems can exist at any level of scale, from single organizations, large and small, to really some of the most exciting kind of system, which is a network of organizations that come together uh, to address some class of, of uh, disease or, or, or other health problems. And then jurisdictional areas can become learning health systems, like states, provinces, and regions, and even an entire nation. And what you see there is Switzerland, which does has a, have a national learning health system initiative funded by the government. And there are those who hope, who dream, that we might envision a scale up from smaller scale learning health systems to a global one someday. Okay, so how do learning health systems marry discovery to implementation? You've already heard about virtuous cycles and uh, the same cyclical improvement idea, which has really been around for a century, uh, is the way learning health systems, in my opinion, marry discovery to implementation in a continuous process. It plays itself in a little more detail with the, a key step, which is the formation of an inclusive, multi-stakeholder learning community which shares a passion to solve a particular problem. So I believe that learning health systems function by identifying and addressing really, really important problems, which could be anything related uh, to, to health and health care. And then the community proceeds through this cycle, first capturing what happens now as data, and also identifying the metrics that would be indicators of success uh, against this problem, and uh, also, therefore, uh, uh, relative to which improvement could be measured over time. They then assemble the data, entering the discovery part, uh, analyze it, creating new knowledge I call internal knowledge, which is then combined with external knowledge in the, in the literature and from other sources, because any problem important enough to form a learning community around it uh, will have been studied by others. The results are then interpreted by the community, and intervention or interventions is designed, and this is where pragmatic trials could come in. You may decide uh, by way of the intervention, not just to change it one way, but to, uh, to change it multiple ways, or change it one way and compare it to, to uh, usual care or some other kind of control. Then action is taken, the system changes, which brings the cycle around to the beginning of the second iteration, 
the implementation continues to be married to discovery because the results of the implementation then generate data to continue the cycle into a full second iteration over which, if things go well, further improvement will occur. So the bottom line here is that better health requires this full cycle, marrying discovery to implementation, and not what I was trained to do, which is this. Uh, and it got me promoted and tenured, got me a halfway decent salary, uh, but before I got interested in the idea of learning health systems, I was engaged in a short circuit of this process. I would collect some data about a problem of interest, analyze it, publish it in a journal, and then go back and collect more data about a, about a different problem or a different take on that problem. Analyze that, create new knowledge, publish that in the journal, and go on. And of course, I did this not believing that um, that this would lead to no good end, but rather assuming that there was someone just waiting to see this article and waiting, it, waiting to put this into practice. But too often, there's nobody home, or the article, the knowledge in the article is not discovered, or for many other reasons, there's nobody home to take up the cause, and things continue uh, in this short circuit of the learning cycle, and as a result, I think we have this 17 year plus or minus latency. Now, you might say that's too cynical, nobody wants that. Uh, so another way to look at this is that many institutions believe in doing this full cycle, uh, uh, this full cycle improvement but the way they are organized, and here the principle of continuity is coming into play that I'll, I'll come back to later, it's, a, it's an interrupted cycle. The entity that does the green part, the performance to data part, is a different entity than the one that does the data to knowledge part, which is a different entity from the one that does the knowledge to practice part. And all of us who deal with healthcare know that handoffs are challenging. They're challenging in patient care, they're challenging in improvement processes. So this model, where you have different entities responsible for different parts of it, creates the need for handoffs and coordination, which too often either don't happen at all, and the process dies somewhere along the cycle, or the handoff does not go smoothly for one reason or another, or runs into different priority structures, well, yeah, we just got this from you, but we don't think it's as important as you think it is, and you're not the boss of us, so we're gonna do something else. This all happens, I'm, I'm sad to say. So that concludes my first of, of three parts here. Now let me quickly introduce in a little more detail these three distinctive elements of learning health systems, but I think you already have a sense from the way I described them of what they are. This first idea of embracing uncertainty. If learning health systems are most useful to address complex system problems, the best position for this learning community to take at the outset is agnostic to any particular improvement intervention. It is open to discovery, and this openness is an important characteristic of this uh, process. So throughout the cycle, the community advances through, through co-discovery because, as we'll see, everybody in a learning community participates. It follows from this that the learning cycle needs to start at five o'clock, beginning with the process of discovery, or as I'm, I'm afraid to say so often happens at 12 o'clock with the actual implementation of an idea that came from somewhere. I've, I've done some work in Saudi Arabia and uh, where they are uh, experimenting with learning health system ideas and people there repeatedly tell me, you know, the Ministry of Health tells us what to do, we try to do it and it never works. That is the consequence, in my opinion, summed up in one little statement of starting the cycle at, at 12 o'clock. The community has to discover 
and develop a commitment to an idea that generated from their own efforts. The second is this learning community idea. And what this basically means is that the community that discovers is also the community that implements, that kind of seals the marriage idea. So you can think about the learning community just kind of turning color as it goes through the cycle, but remains a continuous entity from the uh, green P to D, the blue D to K, and the red K to P. But it's the same core group that follows the whole cycle around, and not this. And, and I'm going to put some labels on the different entities that might, in this interrupted model, uh, also uh, uh, try to complete a cycle. Uh, P to D people could be a group of program evaluators at one part of the institution. D to K could be another group that call themselves health services researchers or embedded health services researchers in another part of the organization. And then there might be change implementers or quality improvers uh, in, the, uh, in a different part of the organization uh, tackling charged with that third part of the cycle. And if these are different entities, you see the potential for uh, uh, handoffs and all of the problems associated with that. Now, learning communities are very special. And I learned uh, from uh, Peter Margolis and his colleagues at Cincinnati Children's Hospital about five or six years ago, where, uh, uh, where a lot of very, very good learning health system work has been done through a collaborative called Improve Care Now, uh, how important running learning communities this way is that they be multi-stakeholder with passion coming from the members who are pursuing a shared goal. I was introduced there because they've worked a lot on inflammatory bowel disease in children, and I talked to parents of these young adults and adolescents and who are volunteering their time for this. This, this passion uh, idea is, is, is really important, and it's showing up in our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest work in the same way. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hit that. So co-production, co-discovery, uh, engaging all members of the learning community is very, very important here. Strategies are co-produced. It's not top-down. Uh, the leadership that's required is a special kind of leadership uh, where the leader has to ensure that no one dominates uh, the community. Now, finally, infrastructure. This is what makes the system a system. Uh, so a simple, love that new bridge, by the way. Uh, the, a very simple analogy to the need for infrastructure uh, goes by asking yourself, if you have to get a lot of people, uh, like you do in St. Louis, across a river uh, every day, one way of doing it is to give them some tools and some wood and say, build your own rowboat and row yourself across. You have a lot of rowboats in the river. Uh, or, in this very obvious example, you can build a bridge that everybody can use. The bridge is an example in contrast to rowboats of an infrastructure approach uh, to a problem. So by analogy, you could try to set up a learning health system by spawning a lot of these cycles, each addressing its own problem and working under the aegis of its own community. And what you'd have is a bunch of cycles. You wouldn't have a system. It's the infrastructure that holds this together. And this emphasis on infrastructure is a big, big differentiator of learning health system approaches, which make the learning health system something that can work at scale and exhibit economy of scale and, and therefore be sustainable. And this emphasis of interest on infrastructure really makes the learning health system concept different from lean and a PDCA and PDSA uh, cycles and a lot of proprietary quality improvement processes which don't embrace this concept. And you can very crudely say that a learning health system is cycles plus infrastructure. Without infrastructure, you just have cycles. So how do you do this? It's all well and good to say you need an infrastructure, but what does it look like? Uh, how do we enable a large set of simultaneous improvement cycles, simultaneous efforts to improve 
against a set of problems, each operating under the aegis of its own community, to function as a domain agnostic, scalable, and sustainable system. So other problems, other communities addressing other problems can come in and attach to this infrastructure just as easily as the other groups uh, joined the system before. Well, to do this, uh, this is called our tornado diagram for, for obvious reasons. You can think about a number of cycles simultaneously operating and uh, piled up on top of one another here in this diagram, each addressing a different problem, some cycling more rapidly, some cycling more slowly, but all basically doing the same thing. They're marrying discovery to implementation and doing the green to blue to red thing. And the infrastructure, which you see is this ring underneath them, is not just technology. A lot of people think learning health systems are all about technology, and I hear very, very often, oh, we got a new EHR, and everybody's using it, so we're now a learning health system. Wrong. The technology is people, technology, process, and policy, all four of these. Very, very important. And I would argue the technology is actually the easiest part. It's the people part, the policies, the processes, the workforce that, that are hard. The benefit of this, I think, is self-evident. Uh, without such a platform, without an infrastructure, every cycle requires its own stuff, its own agreements, its own technology, staffing, analytics, dissemination mechanisms, and there can't be any economy of scale that way. The cost of doing 10 of these cycles will exactly equal 10 times the cost of doing one. Not a good equation. Uh, with a platform, all of the cycles are supported by your shared infrastructure. Everybody uses the bridge analogically. And there's big economy of scale. The cost of 10 cycles is going to be much, much less than 10 times the cost of doing one. And at the margin, the 11th will be very, very inexpensive to add. Another good point about infrastructure is that it enables composition. A lot of us believe that learning health systems are going to spread and develop by composing themselves from smaller scale to larger scale. And if these, if these uh, constituent or component systems have compatible infrastructures, they can compose themselves into a virtual learning system operating at higher level of scale. This is another system principle that plays very importantly here. How much time do I have? I'm good? OK, good, perfect. OK, finally, uh, what does a comprehensive LHS infrastructure look like? And uh, I've got a 7 8 written editorial about what you're going to see that will appear in this journal I shamelessly promoted uh, before. OK, so to see this, look down into the tornado. Okay, you're up in an airplane above a tornado. Look down into it, and, wh and what do you see? Well, you see this. Uh, you see the cycles, the simultaneous cycles uh, in the middle, and then you see the ring in blue and with a little bit of orange. And what a <clears throat> socio-technical infrastructure that supports an entire improvement cycle marrying discovery to implementation can look like is an interconnected set of 10 services. In informatics, we love the word service. Everything's a service. Uh, so I'm, I'm using that. And, and there isn't time today to go through the details of what all of these services do. I'll point out the first one, uh, which is a set of services that will help a learning community organize, start, maintain, and support uh, itself. And I'll give you some examples of this uh, in a moment. And you'll see this is a special service that operates throughout the whole cycle. It's the only one that does. The other uh, components uh, are arrayed in this diagram 
to sit alongside of that phase of the cycle that that particular service supports. So for the performance to data, the service is one that would help the learning community develop and apply tools to measure performance and performance changes. The next service would be one to help the community represent health information as analyzable data. We all know that it doesn't come often in analyzable form. The fourth is very important. Uh, it's, it's a set of services that are policy oriented, that help provide and govern access to and use of data. And I think we all know that not doing this well can slow the process down by months or sometimes even years. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, at the top, you see, uh, you see a service that will help a community merge and interpret the internal and external knowledge that the discovery part of the cycle generated, and that's kind of where the color changes uh, from blue to red, or whatever that color is. So here's um, a summary of kind of uh, what each service provides, group process for one, published instruments to do measurement for two, adopted standards for three, agreements and templates for four, technical platforms and statistical packages for five, knowledge synthesis methods for six, uh, consensus processes for seven, knowledge packaging messages for eight, technical and communication platforms uh, for nine, and implementation frameworks for 10. So I think you can see from what these services have to provide how they are to varying degrees, people, process, technology, and policy. So uh, one way to think about how to assemble an infrastructure, and I think there's good news here, because I think Wash U and the University of Michigan and many, many other uh, call them research advanced, like you're number three and I think we're number nine, uh, research institutions uh, actually already have. And, and part, of the, part of the work of building an infrastructure might be assembling the pieces you have. Uh, another key uh, dictum of informatics is don't build something new unless you absolutely have to. Uh, so uh, no one's, but no one is selling a comprehensive infrastructure kit. I don't see Epic Systems doing this anytime soon, if ever. But, but some really good news is that a lot of open components, some of it uh, emanating from the CTSA uh, program nationally, exist. Um, we have developed an LHS collaboratory, a kind of commons at the University of Michigan, and we see this as a mechanism to uh, work with our CTSI, which was recently refunded for seven years. We were funded under the new program. Uh, everybody's very happy about that. <laughs> Not what we had to go through to get funded, but that it worked out okay uh, in the end. Uh, and uh, the more compatible these components are, uh, obviously, the greater the possibility of composition into a higher scale system that Wash U in Michigan with compatible infrastructures could very easily become a virtual system existing at a higher level uh, of scale. So here's my splash slide showing you all of, uh, just a sample of the open infrastructure components uh, that exist. Every one of these is open source. You see some very familiar ones there like uh, Fire and Pop Bednet and I2B2 uh, and uh, coming around to the implementation side, uh, people who are doing work with computable biomedical knowledge, which is a particular interest of mine, uh, but, but some ones you may not have thought about as infrastructure. For example, the method of deliberative dialogue, which is a way for a multi-stakeholder group to achieve a meaningful consensus. What does it have to do with learning health systems? Everything. If you can't get that community to work and progress through deliberation and consensus, the process is uh, going to stall. You see familiar red cap there uh, kind of at, uh, I don't know, 7 o'clock on the cycle. So in closing, um, th 
some sound bites going back to my main point. What are learning health systems? They improve health by marrying discovery to implementation. What makes the approach different? This idea of embracing uncertainty, that no pre-commitment to an intervention exists at the time the community starts. This notion of continuously engaged communities so that there are no handoffs, and I can't resist a football analogy, therefore no fumbles. And uh, finally, uh, infrastructure, very important, which makes the system a system, enabling economy of scale and sustainability. Uh, what does an infrastructure look like? Well, the best way to think about it is, is as a set of services that, to varying degrees, uh, include people, process, technology, and policy. Uh, please write to me if you have any questions that we don't get to in the discussion to follow. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to uh, talk about this uh, to groups that I know are interested, as you all are, and situated for various reasons to take this idea forward. Thank you very much. While we're all getting seated, I will welcome you to the next, uh, the panel session here. Um, and I'm delighted uh, to have uh, Dr. Friedman along with Nancy Schweitzer, Professor of Medicine, Thomas Kanampalo, Associate Professor of Anesthesiology, and Clay Dunnigan, Professor of Medicine. Uh, uh, I'll start it off. We're gonna, we will open up for questions, and we have two folks in the audience, uh, but we'll start with a couple of general questions. Uh, you know, I was re really intrigued by your talk, Chuck, uh, when you talked about how do, you, how do you integrate all of the different parts uh, of this, and I guess I wondered what other ideas people have on the panel. You, um, sure, you, want me you can to, start. Uh, well, I'm, I'm tempted to say it's becoming somewhat formulaic, uh, that part of the infrastructure that I'm talking about is a set of resources to help people do this. We have a downloadable public document called uh, Creating and Maintaining a Learning Community, uh, uh, for example. And uh, one way to look at integration is how you keep this process moving. Is that, was that the sense mm -hmm. of which you, uh, which you asked the question? Uh, this is going to be a strange thing to say, and it sounds like magical thinking. Uh, but these communities, because they are composed of people who are passionate about solving the problem, keep it moving. And they want to go uh, to the next stage. And sometimes they're very impatient, and sometimes they say, all right, we know enough now. We're ready to go and do, we want to do something. We now know what we want to do. And part of the facilitation process is to say to them, no, you don't, uh, or I don't think you do. And, you could, you know, you're, and they're in charge, but uh, you want to try to dissuade them uh, from that. But this, this idea of the passion that can develop in a multi-stakeholder group, and I heard a lot this morning from Bill Powderly's remarks about some of the community outreach you're doing, you bring in those people from the community, and it's amazing uh, what they will uh, contribute. And a lot of it is just a passion to solve the problem. These are patients of, who either have experienced the problem, or if it's a disease, they have it themselves, or their family members uh, have it. They want this thing fixed. And it's, it's just extraordinary. It's kind of, you really have to try it and experience it yourself. But this is kind of how you keep it moving. It kind of keeps itself moving. Great. Any thoughts on what barriers we've seen to doing that here? Well, um, so first, starting on the positive, we do have a lot of the assets that uh, would comprise a learning health system, and Dr. Friedman's really outlined many of them. A thriving um, ICTS, um, a wonderful um, intellectual capital of the university, a 
large health system that has roots anchored throughout the community in, in areas that are underserved, which are important uh, areas for discovery. Uh, the Institute for Clinical and uh, for, for in Informatics that uh, Philip Payne runs. Um, there's also other assets on the health system side or, or jointly, the Healthcare Innovation Lab, um, the BJC Digital Design Studio. So we could go down the, the list and I think the issue is this one of knitting them together and that, that requires a leadership commitment to, to make it happen. Um, so I, I think, you know, oddly enough, I, I, I feel that uh, a block we face is inertia. And it comes from several forms. Um, there's leadership inertia in that uh, it's a, it, the organizations that we thrive in, WashU and BJC, have gotten to where they are through systematic effort to be successful. And in some ways that's created um, a risk aversion to sort of striking out in a new direction. I think this does require something of a different uh, attitude, a, 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 a greater tolerance for risk in particular, but also a willingness to uh, submit to the will of these communities that form. We, we have historically been a bit more of a top-down health system, uh, and on the WashU side, we've been more of an independent entrepreneurial unit, and those two structures haven't thrived together. So there's, there's a good bit of leadership work to do, I do think the elements are there, um, but I think it's going to take some, some effort uh, on the part of leadership to pull it off. Can I just ask a question, Chuck? So it, I'm a very sort of practical, get in the weeds person, and it seems to me, um, you know, the people who are active in one of your loops in a project trying to get it through um, may encounter barriers that are uh, identifying a place where there's a problem in the cycle where one of those gaps exists. Um, and to Clay's point, you, then you need leadership to help you fill in that mm -hmm. gap. But at the leadership level, is there a way that you can monitor these processes that are occurring in these multiple loops to see if there is a systematic issue in knitting one through 10 together? Yeah, that, that's a terrific point and, and something I didn't mention. There does need to be some lightweight, uh, kind of just right, governance over these multiply co-occurring cycles so uh, they can learn from each other. And this is one of the reasons that we've developed the Commons, the, the LHS Collaboratory. So we have 29 projects. Some of them are infrastructural. Some of them are uh, problem-based learning communities. Uh, that come together in this commons to learn from each other and we, we bring in speakers to you know, keep, keep the inspiration going, uh, speakers from the outside. But uh, that's a, you, you've put your finger on something that's also necessary. And uh, we, are, um, we are now proposing actually for the uh, for the problems that are very clinically and internally oriented, uh, the role of a clinical champion for, uh, for the learning health system. So we're, we're, this doesn't need a czar uh, or a czarina. It, it, uh, it, it needs uh, just the right kind of pushes, and I, I call that lightweight uh, governance, but it's absolutely necessary. Thanks for that point. Yeah. Um, I just, um, I think, one of the most important things I picked up from your um, talk this morning was um, the idea of wicked problems, right? Like, so I don't know if you used it on purpose, the idea um, that LHS is a, a, a learning health, a building a learning health system is a wicked problem. And the idea of a wicked problem comes from a German philosopher who had like multiple ideas about um, what a wicked problem is. And two of the things that I think struck out to me was there's no stopping rule for mm -hmm. a wicked problem and um, there's no right or wrong answer. Does both of these uh, you know, fundamentally apply to um, when we try to build a learning health system? So my, my sort of broad question in this regard is, um, how do we evaluate whether some of the things that we're doing are successful, right? If this is a continuously wicked problem with sort of continuous solutions, um, uh, are there specific things that we should consider uh, in this entire process. Okay, 
so there are a lot of evaluation questions that arise very naturally here. One is within a cycle itself, are we making it better, or are we making it worse, or are we leaving things pretty much the way they were before? I, I mentioned that the, the first, one of the first things that happens is this P to D part where measurement occurs of how bad the problem is now. And presumably, uh, what you're going to do is, after cycling through and trying an intervention, whether it's a pragmatic trial or just a one-shot, everybody does the same thing, you're going to come back around to that P to D and, and, and be able to measure. You have to have those metrics at the beginning, otherwise you kind of don't have a North Star. Uh, in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, we have an easy metric. Uh, uh, survival with good neurological function. Uh, but others require, one of the things the community has to co-produce is consensus around those metrics, which is why deliberate dialogue is very, very, uh, and, and similar methods are very, very important as part of the social infrastructure uh, 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 to, make, to make this work. Another level of evaluation is the system working as a system. Are these people talking to each other uh, we have a we have a kind of a negative example in Michigan uh, of a set of cycles that don't talk to each other. We historically didn't, and these are the CQIs, our collaborative quality initiatives, which we've had for many many years. Uh, Blue Cross pays for them because they write 72 percent of the health ins of the health insurance in the state, so they're very interested in better care at lower cost. So they spawn around 20 of these initiatives, each addressing a problem. And if you look at what each of them does, it's a learning cycle. And they have a learning community. It's not as they're not as diverse as they're, they're now recognizing they would be better off having them be. Um, but they're operating independently of each other, and they're tremendously expensive for that reason. Every, they're rowboats. Every piece of this infrastructure is replicated in every cycle. They're finally seeing the light and creating an infrastructure um, supporting them, and I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to see that. So one kind of evaluation is to what extent do we have an infrastructure that's working? Are we seeing economy of scale? Uh, are uh, they learning from each other? And that's one, the CQIs do do that. They have an all CQI quarterly meeting and they trade war stories. Uh, so, so that's going on. So this, this could be evaluated at many levels, but I think the most fundamental one is inside a cycle, are we making anything better? I have a general question about stakeholders. Obviously there's so many stakeholders in this and how do you incentivize them and what are the barriers to getting community involved and who, who pays for it and, or does it have to be a passion that drives the cycle? Well, it's never just one thing. It's, it's, it's kind of all of the above. Uh, I'll come in our uh, PM&R department at Michigan. The uh, chair wanted to make his department into a learning health system at that level of scale. And when he renegotiated his chair appointment for another five years, he got the dean to agree to give him money to incentivize. Uh, people to uh, participate and pay for some of the support staff uh, that would be needed. Uh, in uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, we took advantage of the fact that there are several uh, uh, grants and studies in place to generate a lot of the data that were needed to form and to support the learning community but the only people we have paid in this learning community are the patients. And uh, we've paid for their, we haven't even paid them a stipend, we've, we've paid for their travel and parking. You all know how much of a challenge <laughs> parking can be. Uh, and we, uh, and, and this thing has been going for three and a half years now. And it's, it's still, it's, it's, it's going strong and we're getting the American Heart Association, which has supported some of this, with, with grant funding, uh, interested in spreading uh, this idea. So, so some of the, 
the, the, the, the success of some of these cycles could generate funding from ent entities, foundations, professional societies, the government, governmental agencies, and others to put resources uh, into it. So it's a variety of places, but we've, we've continued to be surprised how much self-generating energy there is uh, coming from the, the passion that these problems uh, evoke. One, one further point, I was in Chicago yesterday speaking at the meeting of the uh, Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, and I surfaced the idea there, and they kind of liked it, mm -hmm. that uh, since the, the uh, clinicians who are participating in these cycles are learning in context, that this could be made into a CME credit-bearing activity, and uh, they really like that idea, and I think we may see that as another mechanism to incentivize participation. Panel, have any, any comments on stakeholders and how to engage them? Um, you know, it depends on, as, as Chuck says, it depends on what group you're talking about. I think uh, what, we, what we found in the health system side during my time at BJC was that the clinicians were um, by and large very willing to participate in learning communities if they set it up and, and sometimes the only motivation they needed was knowing that there'd be people there to support the, the infrastructure that you're talking about. Um, and and that, that often was enough to hook people. I mean, most people who go into medicine have a natural curiosity and the opportunity to actually advance what they're doing and to learn from it is, is natural. Um, Engagement of the community is an interesting issue, and, and during COVID, we saw all too well the, the pros and cons of uh, community engagement. Um, certainly, and maybe Bill and I talked, we may get into this later, um, we really saw limitations in what we were able to do in terms of discovery because of the political divide and, and the distrust that was engendered around science. Some of it was pre-existing because of cultural and social factors, but certainly got amplified during this time of uh, political division and the, and the politiz politicization of <laughs> science. Uh, so I think those are important barriers to overcome, and, and I'm not sure I understand the tools for bridging that gap. Um, so that, that to me is, is a major barrier. I would just comment that, um, you know, I think it's really important the different stakeholders care about different outcomes. And being a, in the data collection process, you have to be sure you're collecting the data to inform all of the stakeholders about the things that matter to them, not just the data the scientists think is important, but the data the community cares about has to be collected as rigorously and fed to them as regularly as you would, you know, the clinicians or the health systems researchers, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's also the challenge of bringing, to the, bringing together the stakeholders together, right? Like it's the right stakeholders at the place and oftentimes it's only a partial set of people at the table for this discussion, right? And that becomes a challenge over time in terms of both um, understanding the problem and building those uh, interventions and getting to the solutions. That's been, at least during COVID also, those have been the challenges. So, so your point about uh, people having different levels of valuing of, of different outcomes, um, I, I know I'm pushing deliberative dialogue, but it, 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 it is a method that was uh, expressly created to bring diverse communities to a, to a meaningful consensus you know, built around compromise. And I've, I've watched this work now on, on many occasions, and you know, occasionally somebody will throw their hands up and walk out and never come back. But, but that's, the, that's the rarity. Uh, people, uh, the, the, the true um, rewarding part of this for me, or one of them, is watching people uh, come together and work together in ways that, until I got involved in this, I didn't really understand could even happen. We have a couple questions from the audience, so I want to make sure we have time. Uh, there's two on this end. Do we have the microphone? Yeah, thank oh, you okay. for an amazing presentation. I 
took so much from your remarks. Really appreciate it. You know, early in your talk, you, you discussed your, your own academic professional trajectory as sort of the short circuit of, um, of your career development, publication of papers, presumably then moving forward to grants uh, and promotion and tenure. But what you've proposed in this learning health system is actually a very integrated team science approach uh, to making things work. And so how, how do individual members of that process um, achieve uh, professional advancement? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and do you have any suggestions for really how you can use the context of a learning health system and a team player uh, to evaluate um, uh, promotion and tenure, presumably, for academics in that system. Yeah, 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 very good, thank, thank you. A lot of things. Uh, one is uh, you, can, you can publish as empirical papers the work of a learning community. So uh, it's not like the implementation work somehow doesn't have a place in the archival literature. And it's not just my journal that will publish this. Uh, lots of journals will. Uh, so you could even get recognition uh, through the conventional uh, channels of, of publication. Uh, I, I think increasingly it's possible to get grants for doing this. Uh, for doing this work. For example, uh, I don't know if we have any psychiatrists in the room, but uh, the NIMH uh, issued a uh, program called EPINET, which is expressly designed to create a learning health system uh, for early psychosis intervention. Uh, as, as one example, and I think others, I think others are going to be uh, forthcoming. Uh, so we're seeing it's not a tsunami, but we're, we're seeing uh, developments around conventional uh, reward uh, mechanisms. Uh, our medical school has a preponderance of faculty physicians on a clinical track, which has a number of sub-tracks uh, in it, which uh, express career development pathways for, uh, for advancement uh, and the clinical track is perfectly designed, and these criteria are perfectly designed, in my opinion, to support for advancement uh, a learning health system work. Uh, then, there's the, uh, then there's the CME idea that is just bubbling up uh, as, as, another, uh, as another mechanism. So not everybody's going to participate, but for those who choose to do so, at, at least at our place, uh, for physicians, there is uh, there's ample uh, opportunity to be recognized and uh, and career advanced uh, for this kind of work. What about the ethical considerations of publishing research with learning health system type, like quality improvement type of work? Does it have to go through processes, ethical consideration, IRB sort of mm -hmm. processes? Uh, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but it varies. <laughs> Uh, some studies lend themselves to uh, IRB-regulated uh, uh, research, and uh, others uh, come down through a more of a quality improvement perspective, and they are, they are sanctioned and uh, governed through, as everybody knows, uh, a, a different set of criteria. So it's, it's kind of you use your judgment and this is for any given situation. When in doubt, ask the IRB, of course. Uh, uh, but you know, I think most IRBs are pretty reasonable about uh, these uh, kinds of decisions and uh, what requires their jurisdiction and, and what doesn't. We have another question. Yeah, hi. Um, Sorry, over here. Um, it seems to me that the embracing uncertainty is actually really to some extent the hardest thing because I think it goes against human nature. Um, I think um, particularly if you're talking about people like people who work in health systems who are very time pressured, 
and people who are very passionate, um, we, we tend to short circuit um, on large data sets um, and come to conclusions and then just wind up confirming our own biases and don't get to an actual, so how do you get people who like to know that they know, how do you get them to embrace uncertainty? So if it's a wicked problem, the, the more wicked the problem, the greater the probability that uh, people will have nothing more than vague hunches <laughs> about what might work. Uh, the less wicked the problem, uh, the more likely it is that people will have a lot of confidence that they know the answer. As you move along this continuum from more wicked to less wicked, at some point I think you reach a uh, threshold where you don't, need the, you don't need the full cycle methods and maybe the best thing to do if everybody agrees on what the best intervention is or what the arms of a pragmatic trial should be, just go ahead and do that and start, and start at 12 o'clock. So I, I was really uh, referring in my general remarks to the kind of super wicked problem that are so systemic in their origin that it's unlikely that any reasonable person will, uh, will be very, very confident that they, don't, that they know uh, the answer. Uh, and the other thing I'd point out here is that the communities are self-regulating. And if somebody stands up and says, I know what this problem is, I, mean, I, I, I understand it, and all we got to do is X, uh, the more, uh, uh, the, the more, call it reason, people in the group will moderate uh, th that uh, point of view. But I think what your uh, comment suggests is very, very important, that there's probably a level of less wicked problem for which we don't need a canon and, and can, use, uh, can use more uh, simple uh, and straightforward methods to address it. Clay? But, but I think that there are problems we don't know are possible. We think we know the solution. I mean, that people keep trying to come up with wrong solutions. And I think that there's a lot of people who are trying to come up with wrong solutions. A lot of the time, and they can't get away from that because they know the solution. So, how do you get them to go back and embrace the fact that they might not know the solution? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm sorry I don't run as fast as I used to. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, you, you make a good point, and, and w one thing we also have to entertain is if a cycle starts at uh, 12 o'clock and spawns very quickly a pragmatic trial, the result might be a null result or a negative, you know, or, uh, or a result in the opposite direction from what is intended. You, it, the intervention uh, made it worse. Well, if you believe in a cycle, that comes around and the community comes together and says, hey, we weren't right. We were confident, but we weren't right. So now we're going to try something else and they may be humbled into a more full-blown uh, discovery mode. I've never experienced that uh, in my, it, personally, but I think you can easily see how that'll happen. So this. The cycles are self-correcting over multiple uh, iterations in that respect. Um, so I, I hope actually everybody will contribute to this. But so we, three years ago we faced a wicked problem. We had a brand new disease. There were no preconceptions except you know, maybe in Marseille. But um, the, the reality is we didn't know what we were doing. We generated a ton of data very quickly in our academic health systems. So if we had a functional health, learning health care system, how, how could have it have responded more rapidly? And how could it have actually given us rational answers 
to the uncertainty issue about how to actually treat patients in our ICUs, in our emergency rooms. Because in that situation, your goal of getting seven, it, from 17 years to 17 months is too long. It needed to be 17 days. Right. So uh, first of all, more shameless plugs, there's a paper in the Learning Health Systems Journal uh, by uh, the first author is Francisco Ross, a brilliant Spanish uh, computer scientist uh, that lays out the framework we would have, the learning infrastructure we would have needed to uh, address COVID-19 along the lines that you're talking about. And you don't have to read too far into that article to realize to the very large extent to which we didn't have it. Uh, so that's, that's one way uh, to look at it. You might want to take a look at that uh, article. But I, I think you can also view learning health system development as a uh, continuum, back to our inspector and the clipboard. Uh, and I could envision uh, institutions that had a robust learning health system infrastructure in place. And uh, one example might be Mao. That was tremendously, uh, that was, that was tremendously uh, successful, I think, in, in publishing solid science uh, around uh, COVID-19. It's kind of, it, it's, I think they took advantage of their infrastructure. So at that level of scale, if we had more institutions with uh, learning health system infrastructure in place, things would have been somewhat better if we had better mechanisms for composing those uh, individual institutions into learning networks uh, that was attempted, famously attempted by N3C. Uh, and uh, I think we all have our opinions about that. And I know where the uh, votes would congregate. Uh, that, that didn't work in part, I would say, because the individual the constituent institutions did not have uh, infrastructures in place, nor did nor did the people who were putting N3C together have that vision. They just saw it as a big data resource. Uh, yours truly uh, actually uh, tried to append an implementation on ARM onto N3C and was told uh, by the acting director of NCATS at the time that this is a wonderful idea but we don't have any money to support this. So uh, there, uh, there you go. And my, my hope is we can use, uh, we can use COVID-19 as a learning experience, but I, I think the need for learning health systems transcends the COVID-19 experience, and COVID-19 just makes a, issues a clarion call for a learning health system to which we all need to pay attention. I would just add that, um, you know, although it was far slower than it would have been, and a lot of that was due to lack of infrastructure and the sort of data capabilities that a place like Mayo does have. One thing I, I was impressed by during COVID was that those of us who were practicing clinically in the hospital, like there were no meetings, there was hardly anyone there. And so we were talking to each other all the time and there was a lot more multidisciplinary discussion, you know, to your point, the, a group of people, different stakeholders who are passionate about something. And so a lot of good science did happen because we were talking across disciplines in ways that we wouldn't normally in our daily lives. And I think a lot of the good that happened because 17 months was a lot faster than we'd ever done anything before um, happened because of sort of the special circumstances that fostered these sort of passionate groups of people getting together during that time. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. COVID was interesting um, because it provided um, evidence in both directions of the things we're talking about. So there were, there were aspects of what happened that we progressed much faster than we would have historically um, in terms of, you know, the, the, uh, in St. Louis, the, the large health systems partnered together to come up with policies and approaches 
Um, we were, in some, to some extent, a bit unfettered by the conventional restrictions, which would have been, oh my gosh, is this a good idea? What, you know, we need to test it and it needs to be vetted. Because the, the time pressure was, I mean, people were dying in our emergency rooms. It was, we don't have time to go through all that. We've just got to do it. On the other hand, we saw nationally how long it took us to go through discovery cycles. I, I think the UK showed great evidence of what, what could happen if you really set up the whole system as a learning health system. You could get to answers quickly. I mean, we should have had the answers about hydroxychloroquine and everything else within a few weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, yet it took us, you know, better part of a year to start to get to f definitive data. So um, COVID, COVID both uh, showed us what could happen if we relaxed some of our risk aversion and uh, also revealed the, the weaknesses because everybody had their own infrastructure, their own way of doing it, and we couldn't hook things together very well. Yeah, no, I, I think all the points have been spoken about. I'd say two things. One, um, the point about social structures being sort of an impediment to a lot of the things that we could do. So for example, even to just to bring together the three academic institutions in the metro St. Louis area took a lot of effort, right? Like process in place, legal uh, considerations in, in exchanging data. And the other part I think, Bill, I would say is that um, uh, for COVID it was a reactive process. I think we're a better maybe a little, going to be a little more proactive in terms of the things that, infrastructures that we have built, um, um, at least in terms of data and the structures that we could come together as BJC and WashU and bringing together just the data took us, I wanna say several weeks before we figured out exactly how we were going to exchange data and things like that. So I think at this point, some of those things we have figured out in terms of proactively thinking about this as a learning health system as opposed to being you know, reactive to the next pandemic that comes by. Yeah, yes. and, and I would make an additional point. Uh, uh, Dr. Payne and I uh, came together around what was a kind of infrastructure tsunami because all of these entities were trying to build data resources and there were just too many of them. And they were all trying to do the same thing. And I'm part of our uh, CTSI uh, uh, informatics group, and we were just getting flooded. So we just came together and put a group of us together to, and the interesting thing is it's become a kind of learning community. We, we continue to meet, even though the original problem that brought us together is somewhat uh, past. But what brought us together was a recognition of a need for infrastructure that was overdone and unregulated. We asked my former office, uh, ONC, which actually has in its mission to take control of this, but Don Rucker, who was the head at the time, didn't want to touch it. It was just a political uh, live wire, political third rail. And, uh, and then uh, what they also missed, and this goes to my point about N3C not realizing the need for implementation infrastructure in addition to data infrastructure, is that what they were gonna end up with is a lot of papers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, okay, fine, what are we gonna do with those papers that come out of N3C? Is anybody, we need somebody there ready to take, receive them and do something with them, there should be some consensus process that we tried to put into place to process this work coming out of N3C at national scale and offer at least recommendations for what of this is implementable. Other question here. Good morning. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. Um, I was intrigued by uh, something you said, which is that, uh, which I agree with, uh, Implementing these platforms has uh, an enormous potential for increasing efficiency in our systems and also reduce cost. But beforehand, um, what would be in your mind, and you may speculate, the cost, the initial cost, not only in terms of money, but in terms of people and um, time to have a system in place like this in an institution like ours, for example, with our partners around? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's a great question. Uh, when I talk to my 
chair colleagues about this, uh, a, a response that I typically get is, we can't afford this. Uh, and we're going to have to install uh, millions more dollars worth of IT uh, to get this to work. And uh, the approach I have actually taken, and, and in addition to advocating, is a gradual bottom up, put one foot in front of the other, start with a few cycles, let them run, do their thing, let the demonstrated success, if there is demonstrate, success to demonstrate, uh, generate uh, further interest, take the substantial infrastructure we have that I'm sure is very similar to the infrastructure that exists here, uh, and from ethicists to uh, IT geeks, uh, uh, fold them in, use this commons as a mechanism to get them all talking. I, I would not advocate uh, a top-down uh, approach uh, to this. Uh, the, the cost of doing it that way in the larger scheme of things is, does not have a very big coefficient uh, at, attached to it. And uh, it kind of, and when people say this is going to cost too much money, I say to them, I don't think you're thinking about this the right way. Uh, let's, you know, it's, and it, it's, a, uh, it's a coalition of the willing, and some of the willing have, uh, some of the willing have money to put into this, not a lot of money. Uh, uh, I've invested a lot of my department's uh, discretionary uh, funds uh, to support this one with a little, a few bucks here and that one with a few bucks there, as have others. And it's been, uh, it's been a guerrilla uh, uh, kind of uh, tactic rather than an all-out frontal assault, to use an unfortunate military uh, metaphor, but I think it's apt. Um, at the risk of somehow bridging the panelists and the questions, uh, just like a follow-up comment to that, and I'd love to hear your reaction. Um, a lot of times when I think about the infrastructure, I actually think that we have the infrastructure, but because of how we are set up in terms of decision-making, in terms of what I often refer to as the connective tissue between that infrastructure, we fail to leverage it the way that you're describing. And so, in some ways, I think of it not as an um, investment problem, but rather how we leverage our investments. And I, I feel like I'm getting dangerously close to the comment you made earlier and I already tweeted about, which was, just because you have a new EHR doesn't mean you have a learning health system. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that you know, mature academic health centers like this one often have almost all the pieces you described but we don't use them the way you described. So I would put that out there maybe as a provocative statement to respond to. Is it a matter of investment or is it just a matter of culture and leadership around how we use that investment? Because I would argue it is culture and leadership. Okay. It would be useful to ask yourself, to make it into an empirical exercise, how many of the resources on that splash slide you already have deployed here? Or if you don't have them deployed at enterprise level that you have substantial pockets of people who are using uh, that. I think that would be an interesting exercise, and I bet you the fraction would be pretty large. We have one time for one last question, then we have a break. Um, thank you, I think, over here. <laughs> so, thank you, that was a wonderful talk. I actually wanted to go back to what my colleague raised, because I thought that was a critical point, is that of uncertainty. Um, I can't help but wonder if uncertainty is related to the concepts of openness and humility um, in our community. And when I say community, I don't just mean the scientific community, academic community, but at large. Um, for me personally, I feel like openness and humility results from wide, wide variety of exposures, so diversity and inclusion of people who are at the table, who are at the room, who are in the building. So that brings me to this gentleman's comments about community inclusion. Um, we talk a lot about community engagement, but often I feel like it's this checkbox we have to mark to appear inclusive. But I think COVID have reminded us all that we can have all the fancy science in the world, but it will go nowhere. 
So can you comment a little bit on how your learning health systems embrace the concept of having community co-ownership of the health system instead of just mere engagement and input at discrete time points? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so one way to come at this is to just tell a few stories about things that I've seen happen. Uh, a really nice development is that PCORI funded one of the PCOR net networks, the one that we're in that's based in Pittsburgh, to uh, actually uh, be become a learning network by actually attempting to implement across several of the member institutions the results of some of the papers that came out of research in which PATH network-based research in which PATH participated. So we've formed three learning communities now around three wicked problems, uh, one of which is chronic back pain. And we uh, are having early meetings of these learning communities. I'm attending as many of these as possible. And in one of the meetings, uh, well, the, one of the authors of the PATH study that uh, was prioritized through a deliberative dialogue process that we did to form a learning community. And the author of that paper was there, but also a lot of patients who suffer from chronic back pain were there. And the author of the paper, very confident sounding person, uh, said, well, uh, here's what my paper showed, so this is what we should do and just implement the recommendations of our paper. And the patient said, wait a minute, not so fast. Um, some, of, some of what I'm reading in this paper doesn't apply to us. The, 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 the story is more, is, is more complicated, and we have to take the position that what your paper recommends as a result of the analyses that were done is something we should consider uh, but not, at this point, uh, be committed to do. And I'm watching this on Zoom going, yeah, 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 go, go, go. Uh, and I, I was very curious what would happen, and the paper author listened carefully and said, yeah, you know, you know there's, may, maybe that's what we should do because everything you're saying is making sense to me. Every study has limitations. and." Uh, minded as well. So I, I think that as patient stories come into this, they are a profound uh, uncertainty fuel, uh, because they tell their stories and the wickedness of the problem, the multifactorial, multifactorial causes of the problem, uh, the equity issues, social determinants of health, hey, wait a minute, it's all well and good to say I should go to a physical therapist, but you know what it takes for me to actually get to a physical therapist? Uh, and, and here are the problems I have getting it paid for. And suddenly this is a social problem. Uh, if physical therapy is a kind of uh, effective uh, uh, treatment for low back pain, uh, all of a sudden the problem has shifted to getting people a access to care they need that if they could only get it might be very effective for them. So it's the, it's, it's the multi-stakeholder nature of this and, and the facilitation of the learning community that allows these points to come out and not be dominated by one particular person who came into this thinking he knew the answer. I, I hope that helps, having a concrete example. Great. With that last comment, uh, I want to close the panel. Feel free to come down and chat with any of the panelists. Uh, there's a break now for 10 minutes until 11 o'clock, and join us back then. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for those questions.